Thank you. Thanks for the invitation uh, to be here, which is always a pleasure. Uh, this conference is about spectral algorithms and random walks on random networks, and I was hesitating what to speak about, so I'm not going to talk about random networks. I'm not going to talk about random walks. I did have a talk for something about that, but it was too short. So if you want a second talk, if I finish early, I'll give a second talk. If not, you can ask me privately. I have a cute story to tell there. And I'm not going to talk about algorithms either. So the only thing remaining is spectra. So I'm going to talk about spectra of large random matrices, which is kind of side to this conference because they are not going to be sparse. So I'm really an outlier here. <laughs> Okay, so what I'm going to discuss are determinants and specifically characteristic polynomials of random matrices. So this is a long story. Let me give you some background. So throughout the talk, you should think of Xn as a random matrix, and what you should think in, in the back of your mind is something like GUE, but I will... Oh, if you prefer, you can think about Wigner. If you further oh, prefer, and actually a lot of my background will be about the case of CUE. So this is going to be an n by n matrix with eigenvalues, which I will denote by lambda i. And the first statement in all of these cases is that if you look at this object, say minus this expectation, this converges to some normal sigma f if um, f is smooth enough. So this result has a very long history. It, um, it goes back to Johnson in the context of Wishart matrices, or work, early work of Pasteur and collaborators. So it's really, uh, um, so it's really a long history. In particular, in the Wigner case, you could ask, you can write down the variance sigma f square. It is related to the h one half norm of f, and. Uh, it is not even proved in that case, in cases where the variance is finite. And in fact, that's an interesting side question that one could talk about a lot. So what happens if f is not smooth enough? Whatever not smooth enough means is um, there are lots of directions you could go. So the interest today, is going to be when f is essentially rf of rx is log of z minus x. So you would recognize then that this object becomes the log determinant of z minus x. Okay, so that's obviously not a smooth function at z. Uh, we will be interested both in, um, so we will want to take care and parameterize by z because eventually there will be interest to look at it as a process in z and not just as one dimensional object. Um, okay, so why is that, or where does this question come from? Well, early on, and early on means now uh, almost 20 years ago, uh, people started looking at the CUE, where now Z is in S1. So uh, CUE is just a random unitary matrix, hard distributed. 
And uh, the basic fact is that if you look at that case, a trace of x to the k, this is very, very close to a Gaussian random variable. So um, those are Gaussian, independent, and are variance k. And the original proof is representation theoretic, and, and it actually gives more than this statement. Uh, I said very strong, in fact, it tells you that if you take moments of this beast, and even mixed moments of several such things for different k's, uh, if the moment you take, the total moment you take is less than n, the expectation of that moment is exactly the same as you would see for the Gaussian case. So it's an algebraic equality. So of course it proves the CLT for traces, but it proves actually much, much more. And then, of course, once you have a result like that, imagine for a second that Z is not in S1, but let's say the modulus of Z is larger than 1. Then you can expand, and you would get, so I'm going to call that MN of Z. And then uh, you would get that you can expand MN of Z as the sum of a k of traces of x to the k divided by k times 1 over z to the power k. And of course, you can expect that you can truncate this series for uh, z on the unit circle to get uh, a correct answer. So it turns out that for z equal 1, you can truncate at k about n, and this gives uh, CLT. Now, if you, look, um, if you look at that together with the variance, you see that you get a sum of, as you should expect a sum of independent variables with variance 1 over k. Since you truncate at n, this will give you a variance of order log n. So, um, so this will give you a variance of order log n with a constant that you can explicitly compute. So this was indeed proved, so I'll put here some names. So Keating and Snaith uh, proved this kind of CLT. There's an earlier result from about the same time by Baker and Forrester. And uh, so this, both these things prove a CLT for exactly this object. Um, the interest, uh, I mean, the names involved can hint at that, but the interest comes from relations with a Riemann zeta function that I'm not going to get into at all. So uh, lots of statistics of these objects are related to, are expected to be related to statistics of the Riemann zeta function. Okay. Um, and then there's a result of use Keating and O'Connell from around the same time, there was a lot of activity at that time, which gives a multi-dimensional extension and of wind, we and which explicits a log correlated structure. 
So by log correlated, I mean that if you look at the expectation of x of, uh, not x, mn of z, mn of z prime, this should behave like log of uh, z minus z prime uh, uh, maximum with 1 over n. with a minus, I guess. Okay, so, uh, so that's, a lot, that's, that's what comes out from these studies, and this is a prototype of what we should expect in greater generality. So this is what this talk is about. So why is that of interest? Because both for re relations with, uh, with uh, Riemann, Oh, sorry. With the Riemann zeta and for interest as an, as an example of a non Gaussian log correlated field, um, you could ask what happens if you want to look at Mn, which is a sup Mn star, which is a supremum over Z equal 1 of the log of, of Mn of Z. Okay, and um, this has some history. So there's a conjecture of Fyodorov Heiri and uh, uh, Keating. which is not so old, and that has generated a, a lot of activity, which is a, a precise prediction for law of maximum. And uh, view, in view of my introduction, you should not be surprised that uh, one conjecture that this would be related to the maximum of a certain log correlated field. Okay, so in fact, uh, significant steps have been done in that direction. So there's a work of Argan, Bellius, and Bourgard. Uh, so now we are talking about the CUE case. And then of Paquette and myself, which says that Mn star is C1 log N minus C2 star log log N times one plus little order of one. And the real clincher is the work of Chiabi. Oh, I'm never sure if I'm spelling it right. Oh, I hope so. Madol and Najnudel. From a couple of years ago, who erase this and do this in the sense that the difference is tight, okay? Um, and in fact, in some recent work, Giabi and Najnudel showed that not only you can say things about the maximum, but you can actually say things about the determinant itself. In particular, if you look at the determinant itself as a measure, or a power of the determinant, properly normalized as a measure on the circle, you do get a Gaussian multiplicative chaos. Exactly. So in the limit, you get precisely a Gaussian multiplicative chaos, which is a remarkable result. I should say that the results work for any beta. So now comes the second ingredient in what I want to discuss. So what does any beta mean? Well, 
the CUE joint distribution of eigenvalues is just a product of lambda i minus lambda j to the power two. But there is nothing sacred about the power two, so the joint distribution of eigenvalues, you can take it to the power beta, and when you take it to the power beta, uh, you get what is called the C beta E. So now there is no, there is no directly a random matrix from the classical groups, but there is a representation of that in terms of large random matrices, actually large sparse random matrices, in fact, five diagonals. So there is a model of C beta E matrices, which is five diagonal using the so-called uh, CMV matrices, and uh, using that, uh, you get this joint distribution, and in fact, that representation played a crucial role in their work. So I want to describe a little bit of their work. So it turns out that using this sparse representation of C beta E matrices, you can represent everything in terms of Verblonsky coefficients. So those are random variable gamma j, uh, which are complex independent. I'm not going to, to, uh, to tell you uh, so uh, phase uniform and variance of the modulus is 1 over j. I'm not going to tell you exactly what they are. It's not important for the purpose of the talk, uh, what is important is that you can write, you can look at this uh, determinant as a polynomial, and now it turns out that you can write it in terms of orthogonal polynomials with respect to the measure determined by the eigenvalues. And when you do that, you get a recursion. So the recursion you get It's a certain object called proofer phases, and I want to write the recursion, so I'm writing it as a function of theta, since z is on the unit circle, I can parameterize by the angle, and you get something like that. of a certain orthogonal polynomial, which can be then related to, related to the determinant, this log can be written as a sum of the log of one minus gamma j e to the i psi j of that. Now, uh, the relation between psi k star and the determinant is simple. It's just a linear combination of psi k star and psi k minus one star, phi k star. Now, uh, this formula is remarkable for the following reason. If I look at a single theta, what is written here on the right-hand side is a sum of random variables, not independent a priori, because the psi is a solution of the previous recursion. However, uh, um, it is not hard to see that if you look at a single theta, because the gamma has a uniform phase, this thing will have a, 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 this thing actually doesn't matter if I look, for example, at the modulus because gamma j has an additional random phase uniformly on zero to pi. So even if you condition on this psi j, this object here is just an independent random variable. 
okay? So this means that we have a direct representation of something very closely related to the log determinant as sum of independent variables. Okay, so from this you get immediately CLT. And not only CLT, but CLT with variance log n. Of course, what they were interested in is something much more refined. They were interested in uh, the maximum, so you need to show correlations. When you do correlations, things are not so simple because now you cannot argue as simple as that because for different theta, things will be correlated. However, it turns out that the correlation structure is very close to a tree structure, uh, and that was a key to their work. Anyway, I'm not going to talk too much about uh, their work, but the recursion is going to play an important role in what follows. Uh, there is work in pro progress, but that I will not discuss, about the law of Max. Okay, now uh, I should finally also mention recent work uh, about mesoscopic CLT. So this is a central limit theorem for a particular statistic. I, it, I told you earlier that there are central limit theorems for smooth functions. There are also more recently central limit theorems for mesoscopic statistics in which you rescale a smooth function around a certain window, okay? And this turns out still to have, so there's work of, of uh, Gauthier Lambert and there is work of uh, Beckerman and Loda. Okay, now one last comment in this background is that you can deal also, can deal with other models, with other unitary models, and in this context, again, a very, very sparse matrix is, of course, a permutation matrix. So for example, in the permutations. So on the one hand, it's sparse. On the other hand, if you think for it uh, on it for a second, you will see that everything is determined by the cycle structure. So really, you have to understand well the cycles of such permutation matrices. And in fact, the log that of uh, 1 minus e to the i theta uh, times that permutation pi n, you can write as a sum. And here you will have Cl of n log of 1 minus e to the total because for a cycle, the roots just become the roots of unity. And CLN is just the number of cycles of lengths N. Uh, L. Which is essentially a Poisson process. So heuristically, without going too much into details, you can see that these are almost independent. They form a Poisson variables, and you have again a sum of independent variables. It becomes clear that if you want a CLT, you have to make sure that your theta doesn't have an arithmetic structure that will make this thing close to zero too often. And indeed, so the result back in the old days I mentioned earlier that for CLT you need that n to the gamma times n theta t. So that's the distance on the torus from zero. Uh, so if this is larger than zero for some gamma positive, then you get a CLT, uh, gamma less than infinity. Then you get a CLT. This is a result due to Humbley and co-authors. 
Okay, so th there has been a lot of work also on that model, and in particular for the maximum, there's work of Nick Cook and myself, which only gives leading order. So, so if you compare to that case, it gives a C1 log n type of result, but the, the, for a fichiando of this kind of problems, uh, it's a somewhat surprising C1. So it's not the one you would at first guess from first moment considerations. Okay, so my focus, oh, that was longer than I wanted or expected. So my focus is today is going to be the real case. And in particular, G beta E. So what is G beta E? Uh, uh, G beta E means that the joint distribution of eigenvalues is lambda i minus lambda j to the power beta e to the minus n sum lambda i squared. And this is now a joint distribution on n points in R. Okay, so for smooth, so now let's see what is the analog of what I told you so far. So for smooth F, we have sum of F of lambda I minus the mean goes to a CLT. In fact, you can say more, you can remove here the integral of F d sigma, where sigma is a semicircle, and then you will get a CLT with mean A and variance B, Bf. In general, unless beta equal two, you may get a mean. Um, so in some generalities, this was done by Johansson, and uh, those later, so this used loop, was so-called loop equations, and then in integration by parts, basically, that those work of Alice Guillonet using stochastic calculus. And there are, so this area is, I mean, I cannot cite everything. It's, so what about the log determinant, which is the object I was interested in? So log determinant just mean we look at log of z minus lambda i, we sum that, and what can we say about this? So surprisingly, this is, at least I'm not aware of results like that in the literature, except for the following one. So, uh, which is very relevant to what I'm going to discuss next. So tau and vu looked at exactly this question but for z equals zero. And to appreciate the significance of z equals zero, uh, we will see that in, in a moment. And they showed that this gives a CLT. This is true for GUE, GOE, and in fact for the whole class of Wigner matrices, satisfying certain moment condition. So by Wigner matrices, I mean matrices with independent entries except for the symmetry uh, constraint. And in their proof, the key step is actually to prove it here for the GUE and GOE. So the, the move to Wigner matrices is done by a replacement principle that has been used a lot in the study of spacing, et cetera. So I'm not going to discuss this step. But for GUE, GOE, in fact, their proof, although they don't do it, it could work as well for G beta E, for general beta. And how does this proof go? So what happens is that for what happens is that for oh, this real matrices, there is a replacement to the recursions I wrote before 
using, uh, using the um, Verblonsky coefficients, and this replacement is actually uh, simpler. So instead of a five diagonal matrix, you end up with a three diagonal matrix. So by using a sequence of household reflections, you can rewrite your matrix in the following form. Oh. Your Xn is unitarily equivalent to a three-diagonal matrix, where well, here you have So here is your sparse matrix. And if you do the, so this is due to the, the first, as far as I know, the first people to notice this is Dumitriou and Edelman. And here the AI are normal zero, uh, Okay, um, square root two over beta, one over square root n, and the bi are chi random variable of this form, which you can rewrite as square root i over n plus some Gaussian over square root n. Plus something times one plus little order on that. Okay? So, uh, so we have something like that. Now what is nice about that? That you can write a recursion for the determinant directly. So the determinant itself is an orthogonal polynomial and you can write a recursion. And the recursion will look something like that. Phi k of z is a k uh, uh, minus z times phi k minus one of z minus b k squared times phi k minus two of z. Okay. Now. Uh, I should say that from now on, everything I'm telling you is work in progress, and it's joint work with Fanny Augery, who's here, and Rafael Boutez. Okay, so now, first of all, you see that something happens when z equals zero. Because on a very coarse level, when z equals zero, a k is small, and b k square is of order one. So up to rescaling, that would make the p k square to be essentially one, more on that in a minute, what you get is a kind of recursion, which is a small perturbation of the recursion phi k is minus phi k minus two. Okay? And that is playing an important role in what, um, in what uh, Tao and Vu are doing because you can rewrite this after rescaling um, by, by the right exponential. So essentially you have to rescale by something like k factorial. The right, the right scaling of the log determinant will be related to k factorial. So after rescaling, you get a system of equations of this form. plus a noise term, which actually looks like this. 
I'm skipping a lot of the algebra, but basically you get a system of this, of this form. Uh, so there's been a lot of rearrangement. I didn't tell you what WK, WK is just Z square root N over K. <coughs> now let's discuss for a moment the case of tau and vu. So, uh, sorry. So in the case of tau and vu, wk is zero. It's just not zero. And <clears throat> you get an expression which looks as follows. Since it is a small perturbation of um, the recursion that takes psi k plus one to psi k uh, minus one, then it's best to write psi k plus one psi k to be, by iterating this, it's going to be something like psi k minus one psi k minus two plus some noise term that I will call delta k times psi k minus one psi k minus two. Something of this, of this form. And then if you write, so, what do we expect? Maybe I should say. What we expect is a CLT for the log determinant. So we don't expect a CLT for psi itself. We expect for the log of psi. Now psi, of course, is in general uh, oscillating. So we really would like to have a, a, a CLT for the norm of psi or for psi square. And in this case, a good statistic is just to look at uh, at just psi k plus one squared plus psi k squared. And the point is that, so if we, let's define this as uh, a k. That's not a very good notation, maybe I should say, well, maybe I should have taken two k plus one and two k. Uh, to be consistent, but the important thing is that you'll get something like AK is, AK plus one is AK times one plus a perturbation. And now, how does this perturbation look like? Well, uh, if I normalize by the norm of psi K minus one over psi K, it will simply look something like uh, uh, one over uh, AK, and here you will have something like psi k minus one, psi, oh, oh, psi k minus two, times a matrix, I will call it G or delta, times psi k minus one, psi k minus two. Something of this form. And you can check, plus something of, little, of lower order. And you can check that even condition on psi k minus one, psi k minus two, this object will have, you can compute its mean and variance, and it will have zero mean, or actually a mean a constant over k, and variance c1 over k. So you get yourself essentially for the norm, or for the log of the norm, 
uh, something like log, so if you write log of ak plus one, it's going to be log of ak times a log of one plus whatever. Actually here there is, yeah, log of one plus whatever. So when you expand, you get yourself for the log, essentially a martingale. Not exactly independent, but you get an independent variable uh, of, of, of this, not an independent, but conditional, you get a variant. So you can apply CLT for martingales. So this is the result. So the theorem is that when you do all this procedure, you end up with a martingale. As I said, they focused on z equals zero, and that's what they got. Okay, so. So now I want to focus on the result, the work in progress, and try to explain to you, and try to explain to you what happens when z is not equal to z. So, First of all, we have to rescale, and now, you have to choose carefully the rescaling. Now, of course, at the end, you want to rescale the whole log determinant, but you are allowed to do it in a way that would be convenient. Namely, at each step k, rescale by a different factor, and at the end, you'll just have the product of these factors. Exactly like square root of k factorial, you can write as a product of terms depending on k. So, when you rescale, it turns out that the right rescale to do, which will lead to an equation of the type that I wrote before, is going to be with uh, psi k of z is going to be the, if phi k is a determinant, so I'm, I think I'm not consistent with my notations, but um, well, x is unnormalized, So now I take my variables and I don't divide them by square root n. Then the right normalization, or, or a good normalization, is the following. And here we will have a term oh, like that, where g And it's some horrible quantity, which some of you will recognize. As the effective log potential, the effective log potential of the semicircle. So it's an object that vanishes on the support and that goes to a different quantity outside the support. And in particular, it goes at infinity like x squared, as you would expect. And uh, of course, uh, when k, we are interested in z, which is inside the support, so z equal two. And when k equal n, of course, this g is not there. 
Okay, now you rewrite the equation, you get exactly the same equations that are written up there, and it turns out that there are two cases. So first of all, in spite of some effort, we have not found a nice martingale as in the case of Tau and Vu. So that's a background. So if someone could find a nice martingale that would mimic that, that would be great, but we don't know how to do that. And if you look at that expression, uh, it turns out, so you can look at this deterministic matrix, which is the unperturbed matrix, forget about the one over two K, that's just a nuisance. And you can look at the eigenvalues of this matrix. And you can see that there will be a, a, a in fact, with the scaling that I uh, wrote here, I'm sorry, uh, with the scaling that I wrote here, uh, Anyway, this matrix will have two regimes of eigenvalues. When k is, sm is um, small, okay, the eigenvalues are going to be real. And exactly at a certain k0 where z square root n over k0 is 2, at that point they will become uh, complex, a complex conjugated uh, uh, pair with norm one. So in particular, when uh, uh, z is zero, this is a purely complex eigenvalues, and that's the rotation we saw before, right? You go from psi k plus one was going essentially to minus psi k minus one. So it's 180 degrees rotation. And this fact that it's an exactly 180 de degrees rotation is the key to the Tau-Vu kind of analysis. Okay, but there are now two regimes. There is one regime which turns out to be easy, which is not at all present in the case z equals zero. which is when k is smaller than k0. Or well, maybe I should not say easy. Maybe I should say easier. So in this case, if you define properly the recursion, so if you define tk to be, so this is this quantity, z square root n over k, we call tk, and you introduce a normal, uh, scaling alpha of tk, which is square root of tk square over four minus one plus tk half, uh, which is larger than one in this regime. Then with the scaling that I wrote, the recursion becomes psi k is tk minus bk over square root k, times one over alpha of tk, this comes from the normalization, from the non-constant normalization, psi k minus one, minus one minus one over two k, plus gk over square root k, psi k minus two. Of course, I'm a little bit uh, cheating because I wrote my chi-square variables as a constant plus a Gaussian, but except for that, I didn't do anything. Now, uh, the important thing to note is that in leading order, uh, okay, so we can now introduce psi k plus one over psi k, or psi k divided by psi k minus one, and call this one plus delta k. And now the stars align themselves in such a way, of course you can write, so when you write this, here you will get this one plus delta k. Here you will get one over one plus delta k minus one. So if delta k is small, you can hope to linearize. Okay, to so just write one over one plus delta k as one minus delta k. And when you do that, 
So assuming delta k is small, you will get that delta k is a k hat plus b k hat delta k minus one for some coefficients that you can compute. But I don't, I don't have time to write down. I'm running out of time. Okay, now the key is that in the e what I call the easy regime, this bk hat is smaller than one. And it's getting close to one as k approaches k zero. So of course you can solve this equation, but you see the terms ak, which include noise, that come from far away in the past do not contribute to delta k. They get washed out by products of B, which is smaller than one. So the main contribution in a precise way is near uh, K naught. And by near K naught, I really mean one minus epsilon K naught up to K naught. And when you compute everything, you get a logarithmic contribution from this area. Now, it's a little bit delicate because the delta k looks like a kind of almost autoregressive process. However, you're not interested in delta k, you're interested in the sum of delta k's because that's what will come. At the end, we have to multiply these guys. So essentially, we have to sum the delta k's. But all that can be done. You can compute the limiting variance and eventually the limiting covariance. Now, I w the really interesting part is the other case for which I have no time, of course. So let me in two minutes sketch the right. I'm running out of time. So let me just sketch in a word what is going on. So what is going on is that you get a recursion of the type that I have described, which is ah, something like, I, this is a good comparison, but you get something like AK, Psi K, Psi K minus one, plus some noise matrix that I'm not going to explicit like that. So you change, so AK has complex eigenvalues on the unit square. So we're going to change base to make it up to the change of base to relate it to, to a rotation matrix. So we're going to write AK to be QK times RK QK minus one. And then written like that, what you get is QK RK plus a new WK QK minus one, uh, QK minus one times this Psi K, Psi K. Now you start multiplying these matrices. So when you multiply QK minus one by QK, K minus, QK to the power minus one by QK minus one, you get a perturbation of the identity. So this whole thing will look like uh, a product of matrices which are going to be one, uh, one plus delta K times RK plus WK. There are some details here that I'm skipping. So this you can again expand. So you'll get something like RK plus a perturbation. Let's call it, uh, I don't know, uh, mu K. Okay, because when you, when you open up, this is small and this is small. So you just expand. And you'll get here something small that involves both RK and everything. And what you can try to do, okay, so a priori, you would say, okay, this is of norm one, this is small. No, not only on norm one, this is really a matrix with two eigenvalues equal one. So what we can try is to linearize. 
Now, you cannot hope to linearize for the whole length because we expect a variance, we expect the result to be exponential of a Gaussian with variance log n. So it's certainly not like a Gaussian. But for short blocks, you can hope to linearize. So the question, how should you should choose the blocks? And the idea is, if you choose a block such as the product of RK is close to the identity, on such a block, you will be at identity plus a small perturbation, and something like the argument of tau and vu could, could be wrong. The problem is that you cannot exactly do that, but since I'm running out of time, I'll leave you in suspense, and I can explain privately to people interested how do you actually do it. Thank you for your attention. It's a limit law, what is conjecture? It's uh, the Gumball law? So, uh, no, it's always a random shift of a Gumball, and in this particular, so you're talking about CUE. Yes. Uh, in this particular case, it will be a convolution of two Gumballs. So it will be a, a Gumball shifted by a Gumball. <laughs> okay. So the, in general, in low correlated fields, the maximum should not be Gumball. The maximum, because if you think of the prototype example, which is branching random walk, you have the beginning of the tree, which has an oversized influence. Mm -hmm. So this gives you a random variable. For example, on the tree, if you have a branching random walk, just take the first edge. Mm -hmm. It has an oversized influence because it shifts everybody. Sure. So there's a shift by in the trees. It's a derivative martingale. Here it's something else. And it's expected to be... Uh, the gamble, and there are some results in that direction by Remy, who looked at the, at the, uh, um, at the, the limiting log correlated Gaussian field on the circle. That one you can prove that it is a, a gamble shifted by gamble. I see. Okay. By, by the way, gamble shifted by gamble sounds uh, sounds mysterious, but it's just the law. If you take IID random variable, it's the law of the maximum minus the minimum. Mm -hmm. And and why should that appear here is a big mystery that nobody understands. Okay. Uh, other questions? Okay, so we may. Uh, Nick? Okay. Uh, if you can use the mic, it's better for the. Right. So for for this work in progress. Um, uh, so maybe I missed it, but is, is this all to get uh, CLT at one point, or can can you from this extract a multi-dimensional? So we believe, but this I'm not ready to announce yet. But we believe that we we will have a um, multi-dimensional CLT, and of course the ultimate goal is to say something about the maximum. But there's still way to go. By the way, it's not clear that for the maximum you need to get a CLT. But it's just weird that the CLT is not in the literature at all, or at least we could not find it. So. And, and this proof also, it treats any beta on an equal plane, yes, right? Yes, yes, so. there's no difference between. The, the only difference is that depending on beta, the, the mean term, of course, the variance term depends on beta, but in a simple way. The mean term, however, there's a, OK, modulo compute. I have a strong <coughs> conviction that at beta equal 2, there is no mean term. Um, which is the case for smooth statistics. For smooth statistics, beta equal 2 is kind of special, and, and the mean vanishes there. And by mean, I always mean when you center by the, the semicircle, n times what you should get from it. Okay, thank you. We may thank you again.